Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here in Nashville, Tennessee, for the Army Association of America's annual conference and trade show, the most important annual gathering of U.S. Army aviators from around the world and indeed aviators from across, Army aviators from across the planet. Uh, also meeting here with industry, thought leaders, media, and more. Our coverage here is sponsored by Bell and Leonardo DRS. And it's our honor to have with us the Deputy Commanding General of the United States Army Training and Doctrine Command, Lieutenant General uh, Ted Martin. Uh, also also a member of one of America's most distinguished military families, sir. It's a, it's a real honor to talk to you. Well, thank you very much. I, I, you know, I just heard you say uh, aviators, aviators, aviators. I think I'm the only tanker in the <laughs> house right now. Maybe General Thurman's still here. Uh, uh, that's, that's right. General Thurman uh, uh, saw him earlier, and, uh, and he is just a tremendous and inspirational uh, figure as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, having covered the Army uh, was, was always a pleasure, uh, uh, covering tanks, uh, especially anything with a hull turret and a giant gun on it is pretty good uh, in and my I'll book. I'll vote for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but Army aviators also are doing... Uh, a tremendous amount of work. Um, you know, we're going, we're at this extraordinary transformation, sir, right? It's a lot like going out, out of the Vietnam War as the United States Army regeared, had a very combat experience for us, but then had to get its uh, head back in the game of great power competition, even though there were troops that were doing that. And throughout this, the United States Army has done both the deterrent and engagement missions around the world at the same time uh, of, of doing counterinsurgency uh, operations. Um, and, you know, you began your career, you graduated West Point in 1983, uh, and, and your first unit was. Uh, uh, in Europe, uh, the 2nd Battalion of the 64th uh, Armored Regiment, uh, the, the Rogue Battalion, uh, where you guys had M1A1s, which I think was really tremendous. You were one of the first smooth bore 120 guys. Talk to us a little bit about the keys to getting this transition right and the role of Army aviation. You know, as folks look at this highly contested battle space as defined in multi-domain operations, there's a little bit of concern about how you're going to get some of these aerial assets operating in contested airspace. Talk to us about the transition and the role of Army aviation going forward in, in this new environment. Well, sure, but before I do that, I think I want to back up a little bit and, you know, talk to you about some parallels that I'm seeing. Uh, I mean, I'm very fortunate to have, uh, you know, been in the, uh, able to serve in the Army for this long. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the parallels that we saw coming out of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, combat operations in uh, Vietnam are about the same as we've been seeing as we, as we disengage. We're still in the fight, make no mistake about it, and every day is a tough day. But, uh, you know, the parallels between uh, this inflection point that we saw coming out of Vietnam and the inflection point as we transition uh, back to our core competencies you know, to be able to win the land battle and large-scale ground combat operations. You know, with the standing up, the recognition that we're, we're behind the power curve when it comes to modernizing our forces, same thing we saw in 1973, we're seeing now, in, uh, you know, we recognize that right now in 2019 that we're a little bit behind the power curve, that near-peer competitors are gaining on us. Same thing was happening when the Warsaw Pact was modernizing and fielding uh, forces as we disengaged uh, from you know, years of combat operations in Vietnam with a specific focus, rightfully so. So the first thing was in 1973, the Army stood up training and doctrine command because we had to get the doctrine right and we had to get the modernization right. At that time, both were coupled there. Uh, you, you know about the big five uh, here in the land of aviation. We're talking about the uh, Apache and the uh, Black Hawk helicopter and all of the other systems. In, in actuality, I believe there were 64 uh, systems and subsystems that led us down this road. Uh, you know, the establishment of uh, air land uh, battle doctrine, which uh, debuted in 1986, but went through those formative years. And then the final thing was uh, the actual uh, Big Five and the 64 other, 63 to 64 other systems that modernized our Army and led to the stunning victory that you saw uh, at Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Many of the veterans are here today. Uh, same thing's happening now. The first thing I would tell you is uh, the Army knows that it had to reorganize and uh, we established Army Futures Command. So Training and Doctrine Command, our, our Army Materiel Command, Forces Command were joined by Army Futures Command under the command of uh, General Murray. Uh, then uh, the Doctrine, we saw Air Land Battle in 1986 and now we've transitioned to Multi-Domain Operations 1.5. And my neighbor back at Fort Eustis, uh, Lieutenant General Eric Wesley is leading the fight uh, to take us to version uh, 2.0. And then finally, the six priorities that the uh, Army has established, the six main uh, priorities. Most importantly here, we're talking about future vertical lift, and I might add, uh, long-range uh, precision fires. 
both of which this community thinks about every single day of the week. So those two parallels are what I believe you're seeing uh, in action right here. So today I had the opportunity to uh, speak to the gathering about, you know, where is Army Aviation going? Uh, the key point I wanted to take away is that we are on a path uh, that by 2028 uh, we'll start seeing modernization in all of the six uh, main priorities, but that we can't wait that long. Uh, Army Futures Command is leading that battle with the Army in full support. Never before have I ever seen the Army senior leadership focus like a laser beam. The Secretary of the Army, the Chief of Staff, the Under Secretary of the Army, and the Vice Chief of Staff, those four and the resources of the Army are all applied to solve these problems and to close the gap and to regain overmatch in every arena that we will face in large scale ground combat operations. Um, you uh, started your career uh, in a very mission command environment, in an environment where uh, the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact was going to sever uh, comms, was going to act in mass on short notice. Uh, there wasn't going to be a lot of time. Uh, you guys are going to have to uh, execute uh, in that environment. What do you think the keys were from then that will be particularly important from skill set uh, capabilities, uh, from cultural uh, capabilities that will be most important given that many of the soldiers uh, and leaders have grown up in a very permissive communications environment over the past 20 years. Yes, we have had the uh, great advantage of, uh, as you said, a uh, permissive environment when it comes to communications. Working in our favor, however, are distributed operations, uh, very brave leaders and experienced uh, at Echelon. So from the young uh, Sergeant E-5 team leaders all the way up to uh, the senior leaders in our Army have commanded divisions and other major uh, units in combat. That's a huge plus in our, our favor. So uh, since about 2013, the Army actually started the shift to the decisive action training environment, DATE, if maybe you've heard that term. But DATE is really preparing ourselves to succeed in large-scale ground combat operations. So turn after turn after turn have been playing out at our combat training centers. I might add that that is really where the revolution in tactics is starting to happen. We're starting to confront the type of enemy that we would have to uh, in the near future and out to 2028, which is our real, our real mark on the wall, uh, starting to deal with uh, you know, communications being jammed, some of our high technology systems being degraded, uh, increased capabilities of the enemy to have near ubiquitous uh, surveillance on us. That is forcing us to change the way we fight. And we're getting to do that on the battlefields of the combat training centers, which I think is a huge plus. Um, are you able, when you synthesize some of these complex environments, able to have that freedom of maneuver that the United States Army has enjoyed for so long? I mean, for example, um, you know, Army aviation has always been in the thick of it. So even when you say it's a low threat environment, it's pretty high threat when you're uh, flying at low level and folks are yeah, shooting at you. Low threat. I, th <laughs> I think those uh, 2,000 Army aviators in there would beg to differ uh -huh. if I made the mistake of dribbling that out. Uh, uh, but but uh, you know, it is going to be far far worse. For example, if you go, for example, into a Russia or a, or a, or a China scenario, have from the standpoint of the training and doctrine command, whose whose responsibility and job it is to come up with, okay, how do we fight and and succeed in these environments? Are you comfortable and confident that the strategies, tactics, training, and procedures you're putting in place is going to allow that freedom of maneuver in one of these contested future spaces? Well, I know, uh, I would say, am I comfortable? No, I'm not comfortable right now. I don't think any, any professional soldier is uh, going to you know, sit back and say they're comfortable with what's going on. But do I think the conditions are set to continue the rapid development of these tactics and the integration of the new systems and capabilities that the Army is bringing online in the near future and out past uh, the next five years? What's really powerful and what I'll, I've seen is the relationship that General Murray, the Commanding General of Army Futures Command, and General uh, Steve Townsend, the Commanding General of Training and Doctrine Command have and, clo and closing up what could become a scene uh, with a close coordination. As I said, my neighbor's Eric Wesley, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, architect of uh, the next version of multi-domain operations. His folks reside in the same building that uh, our headquarters folks work in. But the real work is being done at the Centers of Excellence, down at Fort Benning at the Maneuver Center, uh, to Fort Rucker, Alabama, uh, on the Aviation Center, 
Fort Sill, all of our centers are working together to figure out how we're going to uh, thrive and survive on the future battlefield. And I'm very comfortable with the current uh, progress that we're making. Um, just a shout out, we, do, we talked to uh, Lieutenant General Eric Wesley uh, uh, when we were down at the Association of the U.S. Army's uh, Global Force Symposium in Huntsville, Alabama, which is just an hour and a half down the road uh, from uh, here in uh, Nashville. You know, we, we've heard over and over again, and, and you, sir, talked a little bit about, you know, the importance of doing things differently. I was talking to, uh, you know, to have talked f uh, to folks here about, you know, how better to use aviation assets, for example. You know, you, you talk to some folks who were scouts and say, hey, look, in 2019, we no longer need, you know, a unit on the ground to bump into another unit to tell where it is. That's how we used to do things. We need better integration of those kinds of assets. There isn't a conversation you don't have that doesn't go into cyber, for example, and that actually a lot of the war is now being, you know, fought in a cyber space where folks are maneuvering and counter-maneuvering. Um, you know, when you and General Townsend and General Gaylor and others talk about things, doing things differently, you know, what are, how do you want to broaden that aperture about how folks should be thinking about this space? Because I know that you guys are also soliciting ideas is from the ground up, not just from the top down. Right. Well, uh, you know, the so I've been in training doctrine command coming up on uh, 14 months, and the most fascinating thing I've done there is watched uh, General Townsend. So General Townsend came to uh, training and doctrine command from command of uh, uh, Joint Task Force uh, OIR. Uh, you know, he commanded the forces uh, in the uh, attack uh, against ISIS and the you know the offensive operations in vicinity Mosul. Uh, and I think, you know, we're going to be learning lessons from that uh, for years to come. Uh, but what he has really imparted to us is that they were episodically able uh, with uh, uh, the expenditure of great energy to conduct, you know, what we're now terming as multi-domain operations. And you, you are dead on. Uh, this all doesn't happen in, you know, in silos, electronic warfare, cyber operations, uh, information operations, uh, everything. We're not just talking about gadgets out there. We're talking about an entirely new way to uh, up first understand what's going on in the battlefield and to harness all of these capabilities. So we were very fortunate the first commanding general that was able to actually physically do that on the battlefield with uh, joint and combined forces was helping to guide uh, the creation of uh, version 1.5 of multi-domain operations. And now as we study that and move forward in the future, we're moving by leaps and bounds. Uh, and that's really informing where we're trying to go with our next generation of, a, of, of things or equipment. So it's the ideas and the things. Uh, you know, something that usually goes unnoticed but really is the most important part of this whole equation is, are the people. So people, and by that I mean soldiers, are the number one uh, most important asset that we have. And we're not waiting for 2028. Uh, there's been a revolution in training, and I would just say led by the uh, senior leadership of the Army and uh, informed by General Townsend uh, on the way forward. We've enhanced basic combat training. We've, we've hardened advanced individual training. We've uh, taken an additional 80 hours and repurposed it at our uh, officer training uh, schools. 80 hours doesn't seem like a lot. That's a lot uh, in the fast-paced world that we live in now that's entirely focused on large-scale ground combat operations. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that, you know, uh, although Eric Wesley is my uh, next-door neighbor, his really partner in crime in this whole uh, modernization effort is Lieutenant General Mike Lundy at the Combined Arms Command. So with one foot in the now and one foot in the future, uh, the Army is moving forward systematically to wrap our arms around uh, gaps and to get after both technical and tactical solutions to the problems that we face. Um, let me ask you about uh, accessions and retention. That's a very My big issue. Topic. Your favorite topic, uh, something which I think occupies a more than a little bit of your time. Um, you know, on both of those, there are, there are challenges. We heard from General Gaylor uh, this morning about a 9.5% uh, shortfall uh, or uh, losing about 9.5% of pilots. Uh, the service is trying to do that. He said he's not crazy about bonuses necessarily uh, to do that. Obviously, there are incentive pays, but I think fundamentally, if people are only going to do it for the money, it's going to be very hard for the Army to compete for them. But then there's also an accessions challenge. Talk to us about how you're getting butts in the door and keeping those butts in the seats long enough so that they become the use <laughs> of the future. Seats. You know, we call it, we call it uh, put them in boots. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's a whole of Army approach. So last year, we did not make our assessments mission. No excuse. 
you know, this is a, the United States Army, so I'm not going to sit here and give you a laundry list of excuses, because I tell you, we're all the benefactors of the phenomenal uh, uh, environment that we're, we're enjoying in the United States of America right now. The economy is on fire, and nobody in their right mind would want to back off from that. So this economy is on fire. Uh, our army is uh, picking up and starting to grow again, so we had to change the way we did business. We took a, uh, a in-depth look at our uh, sessions uh, process, everything from soup to nuts, if you were. Uh, again, uh, led by uh, General Steve Townsend as a senior responsible officer, uh, you know, with the Army senior leadership uh, in charge and driving this train. And uh, we have seen sweeping changes. First thing I would tell you is uh, our uh, accessions backbone, the digital backbone, the face of the Army, if you will, on the internet. Uh, was about a decade old. It, di it didn't need to be refreshed. It needs to be completely rebooted uh, with a new system. However, we've uh, gone after uh, incremental modernization while we prepare for our future uh, forward-facing uh, GoArmy.com, and I would recommend everybody <laughs> to go to GoArmy.com where you can find 150 ways to serve your country. Uh, that's, that's one thing we did. The second thing we did is the Chief of Staff of the Army directed uh, that we fill our recruiters to 100%. Uh, and that's saying a lot uh, with uh, the Army that we have and the op tempo that we're undergoing, but we're, uh, we're at 100 percent of uh, authorized uh, recruiters that are out there just doing great work. And then the next thing we did was we, we changed the way we do, do business. We are uh, looking at a complete modernization to our uh, recruiting process. And, you know, when I talk about recruiting, I'm not just talking about soldiers. I'm talking about the officers that are going to fly those helicopters. And so we're working hand in hand with uh, West Point. Uh, most importantly, we're working with uh, Reserve Officer uh, Training Corps, uh, Major General uh, John Evans, and then uh, Major General Frank Muth. I might, I might add that both of those last two are Army aviators. So uh, we're really, you know, putting aviators into the breach here and making phenomenal progress. I can guarantee you we're going to make mission this year. We're going to make mission, and we're going to build the bench for the future, and we're doing that with a whole of army approach and you think that's going to help you also on the retention side of things well right or now, you're going to need more money in order to be able to keep some of these folks? uh i can't speak to the money I, you know again this is a whole of army approach but i can tell you right now uh, uh retention retention is on fire i mean people like the work that they're doing uh, they're an, an invested in the united states army we are not having an issue retaining uh, soldiers uh, retaining uh, the aviators right now with a, a pull uh, to, you know, the civilian aviation community, uh, you know, and the number, the extremely high number of uh, aviators that are retiring from uh, the civilian aviation sector. Yeah, that's a problem. Uh, I directed a, a General right. Gaylor uh, for the specifics on that. But the, but the Army retention has probably never been stronger than it is right now. And I think you're seeing that in the way the Army is transforming. It's an exciting time to be in the Army. This is not the Army of not. This is the Army of uh, we are being taken care of by our government, and uh, we have a righteous mission to defend our country and our way of life. And uh, we, we just have to message that a little bit better to an America that may not have such a close connection to the military as it did 10 to 15 years ago. Um, you uh, said that it's a lot like 1984, and it is the Army is a land of opportunity uh, uh, again. Um, but let me ask you that. that. That's an interesting point you made, and I have two, two questions because I know that uh, you, you've got to run. But one of the questions is, you know, how does, you know, if we look at it, proportionally the Army is ever smaller and smaller as a portion of the overall society. Um, that uh, the nation has chosen, instead of going to a draft, for example, to try to increase the benefits for those who serve. Uh, but the problem is that as that proportion changes and now you get to less than 1% of the population that's serving in uniform, what are some of the different ways to engage? Do you think that there need to be different types of reserve opportunities and programs, uh, more investment on a guard uh, basis? You know, what are some mechanisms we can use to sort of increase military suffrage at the end of the day because the the nation won't be supporting an organization that it doesn't really connect to or feel it has a connection to in some respects uh okay so uh, you know as i said as we looked at you know the situation as it stands right now it, it became evident to us studies have shown that you know uh first off the army is actually growing by about 2k a year in the in the active force 
and, and there are opportunities to serve in all components, the guard, the reserve, the active duty forces. Uh, but fewer and fewer people have a familial connection to the military. My father uh, was in the Army. His father uh, was in the Navy during World War II. And so ser military service was always in the back of everybody's mind, you know, either in time of war or to serve your country, uh, you know, finishing whatever kind of, whatever level of schooling you got to. But you know, uh, after uh, 1975, and then again after 1990, 91, with the downsizing mm -hmm. of the Army, there are fewer personal familial connections. So you know, one of the things that uh, the Army is doing now is we selected the top 22 cities that were currently uh, underrepresented uh, in the United States Army. Good example, Chicago. You know, based on the number of uh, young men and women uh, in the population range, you know, the age range that we're, we're looking at, and are they able-bodied and ready to serve, uh, the numbers there were higher, but there was a lower represent representation in the Army. Uh, that the top 22 cities across the country are what we call our 22 focus cities. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the message out to those young men and women and to the influencers, the moms, the dads, the uncles, the uh, school administrators, the school counselors, to reacquaint them with their army. This is not something we're trying to jam down their throat. We're trying to uh, give them an unobstructed view of the opportunities and the paths uh, that you can take as a young, uh, physically fit man or woman that's propensed to serve your country. There's a lot of ways you can do it. We'd like them to know about the United States Army because I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, I am sold on the U.S. Army. I believe in the product. And uh, I'm excited uh, that more people are finding out about the Army and we're seeing these incremental rises. And I think that if you keep watching us, it might take 18, 24 months, but we're going to turn those cities that are un underrepresented in the Army, they're going to grow, and they're going to grow on that success because those young men and women, some are going to get out after four years and go back, and they're going to look around and go, man, look what they made of themselves. Look at the experiences that they had. We're going to make them into better citizens. That's our job, and we're excited about it. Now, I have not met any uh, uh, body uh, or a general officer with uh, a descendant who, uh, uh, who is a descendant of a Revolutionary War hero. So tell us a little bit about your family's oh, uh, Revolutionary uh, War story. Oh, well, I tell you, first off, there's a lot of us out there. Uh, in fact, my aide-de-camp, uh, his, uh, his wife is a daughter of the uh, American Revolution, oh. and they can trace themselves back. So I trace, uh, our families trace back to uh, the direct line, goes back to a private who served in uh, New Jersey, a New Jersey infantry regiment, and uh, was a soldier, uh, carried a rifle, uh, not any kind of hero, but uh, just, uh, you know, when they were needed, they were there. And uh, I am really uh, proud of that. And I'd like to make sure that we have uh, UK Army uh, liaison officers serving at TRADOC. And, uh, you know, if you're familiar with TRADOC, Fort Eustis is about 10 miles as, as the uh, uh, Sabo round flies from uh, uh, Yorktown. Right. And Yorktown's a holy ground for the United States Army. Uh, so I'd just like to remind them, hey, uh, we're glad you're on the team, but don't forget. <laughs> and uh, your uh, descendant, uh, who, who was that private? Uh, private Daniel Martin, 1st first right. first New Jersey Infantry Regiment. Uh, that's, uh, that's awesome. Now, uh, the last important question is uh, Army football has been on a, on a run. Uh, do you think it's going to be another good year for uh, Army? Because when you said go Army, you know, it's also go Army, but it also is go Army beat Navy. So how do you think it's going to go this year? Oh, well, uh, yeah, so as a former commandant of cadets there, uh, I would tell you that uh, we have now established dominance over Navy. Uh, as you know, uh, my good friend and classmate, uh, Lieutenant General Darrell, uh, Williams is the superintendent uh, there now himself, a uh, former captain of the Army football team. I don't know, you tell me. Have, has the Army put all of its chips on uh, Army beaten Navy again? I think uh, what we're really looking for is, you know, we love our Navy brothers and sisters down there, but when uh, it comes time for Army football, uh, thrashing is uh, what we've got in mind and uh, putting uh, the fourth peg in the, you know, in the win column in a row is uh, the only acceptable option.
United States Army Lieutenant General uh, Ted Martin, uh, the Deputy Commanding General of U.S. Army Training and Doctrine and Command. Sir, it was an honor and pleasure. Thanks very much for all your time. Okay, and if you know someone out there that's interested in uh, serving their country, the United States Army has 150 opportunities waiting for them. Thanks, sir.